Hey guys, time for chapter 14. I'm going to be talking about the antimicrobial antimicrobial drugs, something that we informally dis describe as antibiotics. Okay, as far as our history, uh, we're going to go through some of the developments that led to the to the modern use of antibiotics. But first, just a couple of uh, uh, definitions. Drugs, the term drugs is any chemical that affects our physiology in any manner whatsoever. So that's pretty, pretty straightforward. Chemotherapeutic, these are guys that work against diseases. And the antimicrobials, these are the guys that we give for infections. And again, informally, we call those antibiotics. Okay, as far as the people involved in this in the past, Paul Ehrlich discovered a compound he called 606, and he found out that it worked in, when used um, against syphilis. He called this salversan, and it's basically an arsenic compound. Alexander Fleming is the guy who discovered penicillin from the penicillium mold that grew on bread. And then these guys actually started making mass producing it. Gerhard Domach discovered the sulfanilamide, the sulfa drugs. Selman Waxman uh, is the one who discovered the antimicrobial agents produced naturally by organisms, of which penicillin is one. And that's enough of that. So now let's talk about the types of antibiotics. I'm just going to call them antibiotics, guys, because that's what you call them in the hospital, even though technically antibiotics are only for things that are made by living organisms. So we get these, such as the penicillin, and then the guys the pharma in the pharmacological uh, research, these chemists change them slightly. They alter them, and then they become a semi-synthetic. And by doing so, they can make it more effective, make it last longer, or make it easier to uh, give to the patient than the the ones that occur in nature. And they can also take those and make totally synthetic that are totally made in the lab. Um, again, whether which one we use depends on the organism and the circumstances. Spectrum of act action, this is really important. That's how many of the bad guys, pathogens, that the drug is effective against. Narrow spectrum, these guys are only effective against a few organisms. And in broad spectrum, they work against many different kinds of bacteria. Now, broad spectrum is what we start with. Patient comes into the hospital, he's sick, he's got an infection. I have no idea what's, what bacteria he's dealing with. I'm going to have to start treating him because I can't wait 48 hours to get the lab results back. So we start with a broad spectrum antibiotic that's good against a lot of different bacteria. But then when we get the, the, the lab results and we find out the susceptibility of the organism, then we will switch to a narrow spectrum. Why do we do that? Why don't we just use broad spectrum? Because when we kill all the bacteria in the body indiscriminately, we can actually allow super infections to develop. For example, if I destroy all the normal flora of the uh, colon, then I allow some really, really bad guys like Clostridium difficile to start taking root and grow there. Remember, some of the bacteria that are on us, our normal flora, 
are actually helping us by keeping the really bad guys away. But again, you know, when the guy comes in, we've got to treat him. But just as soon as possible, as soon as we have information we need, we're going to switch to a narrow spectrum. Here's some spectrum for different agents. Isoniazide is almost all uh, mycobacteria, think TB. Polynixin is for the gram negatives, streptomycin, erythromycin, tetracyclines, and the sulfonamides are also going to be our gram, gram negative go to. Gram positive, all of these plus the penicillins. There's some of the penicillin like drugs that have some mechanism of action against gram negatives, but there's not very many. Okay, so that's for our bacteria. For the eukaryotes, the protozoans, the fungi, and the, and the parasitic worms, the azoles are good against all of these. Niclosamide and prosequantil are specifically for the parasitic worms. Against viruses, acyclovir, ribavirin, uh, arildone. Um, this has some nasty side effects. This is like beating something with a wet noodle, and I'm not really familiar with that drug. I haven't used it. In other words, we really don't have a big um, armament with uh, the antivirals. Okay, how do we give these? We can give it PO, which is oral. We can give it IM, intermuscular, or we can give it IV. Now, notice that if we, if we give it by mouth, it's going to take a little while, and this is time. That's an hour, two hours. It takes almost an hour and a half before we reach the peak uh, drug level. And, but then again, it's going to slowly dissipate, too. If you give it intermuscularly, then it's going to reach a peak fairly quickly, and it's going to have a very slow decline. So this is, this is how, where we do our depot uh, medications. And then if you give it IV, obviously the blood levels go straight up, and they stay until you uh, discontinue the drugs, the IV, in which case you'll get a very steep loss. It's going to go down just as fast. Some antibiotics we can only use externally, topical, like polymixin that we talked about. Very good drug. Can't use it. Can't give it to someone internally. It damages the kidneys. Oral route, when we give PO medications, we don't have to stick anyone and the patient can take it themselves. Of course, on the other hand, that can also be a problem because some folks don't like to be compliant with their medications. I am, we put the, put the, the medication in the muscle and it will, will go up fairly quickly and it will be continuously released over a period of time. IV, you're just going straight into the veins. We have to know how these guys are distributed to infected tissues. That's going to be the, the key uh, as far as which one of these we do. Of course, a lot of these we have to, the drug itself requires us. Penicillin G, you can only give IV. There's, well, you probably give it IM, but you can't take it orally because it's destroyed by stomach acid. That's when they came up with penicillin D, which is an uh, acid-resistant form that you can take. Mechanisms of actions, the cell walls, the beta-lactams, which are the penicillins, cephalosporins, monobactams, and the carbapenems. These guys, and we'll, we'll look at that in detail, these guys all attack the cell wall along with vancomycin 
and bacitrace. And bacitrace is another one that we give only uh, topically. But all of these attack the cell wall of the bacteria. Plasma membranes, polymyxin, polymyxin B, another one that can only be given topical. Cholistin, the lipopeptide, daptomycin. Uh, these all are going to attack the bacteria's plasma membranes. We can also attack their DNA synthesis. The fluoroquinolone, cipro and levoquin, monofloxacin, ofloxacin, all of these drugs are going to attack the ability of the bacteria to replicate its DNA. Rifampin will also attack the RNA synthesis the ability of the DNA to make, or uh, the bacteria to make RNA, specifically messenger RNA. Now we also have guys that attack their ribosomes. If we keep them from making proteins, we have killed them. So we've got ones that work on the small subunit and ones that work on the large. For the small subunit, we got the aminoglycosides and the tetracyclines. For the large, we've got the macrolides, the lincosamides. Chloramphenicol is not really used that much. And oxozolidinones are also going to be ones that we'll, we'll see on the upcoming uh, slides. We also have guys that interfere with their ability to do their chemistry. One of the best ways to do it is with folic acid synthesis. These guys make folic acid. We don't make folic acid, so we can attack this without worrying about causing a lot of problems with our patients. Sulfonamides, sulfones, trimethoprim. Uh, Sulfomethoxazole trimethoprim is given in one big large pill um, that interferes with folic acid synthesis in two different places. Works pretty good. A lot of a lot of bacteria are still susceptible to it. And then the, the ones that interfere with the synthesis of mycolic acid, which are going to be in the uh, tuberculosis, the mycobacterium, are going to be isoniazid. It's one of the four main drugs you get for TB initially. So we talked about this when we were talking about bacterial growth. The penicillins, there's penicillin, there's the cephalosporum, monobactam, carbapenem. Everything you can see, that square ring right there, that is the beta-lactam ring. That is the part that actually has antibiotic properties. Okay. Um, we are going to prevent the NAM subunits, remember the NAG and the NAM, from bonding together. Now, this only works while these guys are making their cell wall. It will have no effect at all on the already built cell wall. But these guys are going to divide. That's part of their virulence factors, part of how they they try to get, a, get ahead of us. And if while they're dividing, this is a great drug to give. The beta-lactams, um, there are still uses for penicillin, as old as it is. Cephalosporins we use all the time. And then these guys are more in our cutting edge. But we, we use these. These are more effective on gram-positives because gram-positives have bigger, thicker cell walls. The gram-negatives, there are some that are specifically designed for gram-negatives. But remember, gram-negatives have got a plasma membrane. And then they have a thin wall. And then they have the other plasma membrane sandwiched in there. And it's more difficult for the drugs to get through there. Uh, What happens is when we keep these guys from cross-linking, I've got this on the next page, so, but basically we keep them from cross-linking. Eventually the wall is going to fail, and the bacteria will lice, they'll, they'll absorb water and, and go pop. Um, um, don't 
don't think there's really anything much to say about that. Now, let's talk about these guys. We talked about these when we were talking about amino acids. R group, the old thing R means is this is where something else connects. So there's that penicillin G I was telling you about, parenteral, which means IV, or IM. Penicillin V, and notice that their R group just has an additional O on it. That's it. That's the, o, that's the R group for these guys. Ampicillin, amoxicillin, and methicillin. It's the only thing we're changing on the penicillins or the cephalosporins or any of these guys is what do you have hooked up there? It's kind of like if you had a, a vehicle that had a trailer hitch, what could you attach? You could attach a trailer, you could attach a camper, you could attach a boat. It doesn't matter. You've got the ability to do that. And so by attaching different molecules on here, we can we can give these guys different properties. Okay, penicillin G again, and the carbapenem. I'm not going to go through all that. So <clears throat> there is the penicillin, the beta-lactam ring, that is interfering with these guys forming these links. The NAM subunits don't attached to each other and that means that they're going to fail and when they fail that it means the water which is going to come into the bacteria are going to actually cause them to pop because remember the outside is going to be hypotonic with respect to the inside of the bacteria that was a really good illustration Inhibition of cell wall synthesis, we've talked about semi-synthetic derivatives, more stable, we've talked about penicillin V, uh, easier, easier to get absorbed through the GI tract and to get into the blood, less susceptible to being deactivated either by our liver, which, which is going to deactivate any chemical in our blood over a period of time, and also has... Uh, more bacteria that they're, it's effective against. So inhibition of the cell wall, we're just going to keep these guys from from having their peptidoglycan strong and we're going to keep them from increasing it. And as the bacteria is getting ready for binary fission, it's got to make a lot of cell walls and it's got to make one between these guys. So while they're doing that, we can sabotage their cell wall but again no effect on the existing only for growing or pre-dividing cells okay protein synthesis we can use these drugs because our ribosomes are ADS we have a small 40S subunit and a large 60S subunit. What does those S's mean? This is, has to do with with their density and how fast they they drop down in a fluid. So don't worry about it. Cut for just consider it to be weight or mass. That's good enough. Now the prokaryotes, the bad guys, have 70S with a 30 and a 50. So if we give medications that interfere with these ribosomes will have minimal interference selectively target the bacteria's translation of its mRNA into proteins and again if you shut it down the bacteria is not going to be able to stay alive now recall that I said for the most part it's it's less harmful we do have 70S ribosomes. It's in the mitochondria. Remember when we talked about mitochondria back in A&P? That they even, some folks even think that this used to be a, a prokaryote that we got into a symbiotic relationship with. And remember, these guys have their own DNA and their own ribosomes, and their ribosomes are the prokaryotes. 
So there is some effect, but on balance, the the good that we do by getting rid of the bad guys is outweighed it outweighs by very by very far the minor damage that we will do to the mitochondria. So I think that makes sense, guys, because there is no such thing as a as a totally safe drug. Aspirin, Tylenol are the two most common drugs that people overdose on and come to the hospital with. Yes, Tylenol will kill you if you take enough of it. So there is nothing that's going to be totally uh, safe. And while we're on this one, let me go ahead and say this. This is the, this is the big issue with antibiotics. We need something that will kill the bad guys or at least slow them down and not harm the patient to any great degree. I mean, we can cure any, absolutely any infection. All we got to do is set our patient on fire because we know incineration will totally sterilize it. But the patient probably wouldn't think that was such a good outcome. And I can't say I blame them. So we have to find things that are selectively targeted that hit the bad guys but don't hurt our patients. And that's never going to be 100%. Chloramphenicol is one that we really don't use anymore. The macrolides, lincosamides, these guys are going to bind to the 50S, going to keep these guys from binding together. No, no peptide bonds, and that's going to stop the protein synthesis. Aminoglycosides are going to bind to the small subunit. They're going to, they're going to keep the proofreading ability of this subunit from being expressed resulting in faulty proteins because if there if there's no proofreading then errors can go through and you get dysfunctional proteins tetracyclines are going to block the binding of the trnas and if the trnas cannot bind if they're blocked from from the codons then that's it. Protein synthesis is done. These are really good, and I suggest that you guys spend time with this table. Um, I would know this. I would know these classes. Linozolid is also a um, relatively new antibiotic. So here are the drugs in the aminoglycosides, streptomycin, gentamicin. Usually in gentamicin is given with ampicillin. We use, give those two drugs because they're, they're synergistic. They help neomycin, canamycin. These guys are cytal and they're broad spectrum. So you're going to find that the cell wall antibiotics, the ones that attack the cell wall, are generally fairly narrow. But almost every bacteria is going to have a 30S and a 50S, right? So it makes sense that these guys would be broad spectrum. But there is an exception to that. The tetracyclines, tetracycline, doxycycline, tigacycline is also a brand new one that we've, we've been using. These guys are bacterial static and again broad spectrum. Macrolides, erythromycin, azithromycin, the famous z pack tylithromycin, these guys are bacterial static and again they are broad spectrum. Lincosamide going to be lincomycin and then this guy here which is very is infamous um, clindamycin these guys are bacterial static and they say narrow spectrum but clindamycin is one of the main drugs that will give you C. difficile but whatever uh, chloramphenicol it's not one that we use anymore and the linozolide and I didn't even go through the mechanism of action. You guys can do that on your own.
Because I think basically we've already talked about that. Disruption of cytoplasmic membranes. Now we're going into the antifungals. So fungus, again, the fungus has a cell wall, but it's not made of peptidoglycan. It's made of chitin, C-H-I-T-I-N. Basically, it's very similar to the stuff that, that shellfish use for their shell. So we know that if we can punch a hole in a plasma membrane, we can let water in or let things float out. Because remember, in diffusion, water moves if the solutes can. But if the solutes can move, then they will move to, to uh, establish an equilibrium. But in any case, amphotericin B or gosterol, remember that we have cholesterol in the plasma membrane of our cells in order to uh, stiffen it up. Fungi, they are eukaryotes, so they're a lot like us, so it's hard to target. But here's one thing that we can target that they have that we don't. Cholesterol is similar to it, so it's not a totally free ride, but it's the best, one of the better bets we've got. So amphotericin B is going to attach to these guys and, and basically cause a hole to be there. Uh, bacteria has no effect on them. They call this the amphibian terrorist. It's, it's nasty. The side effects are kind of nasty, but if it's a matter between a very serious fungal infection that could maybe lead to death, then it definitely is your go-to. Uh, all the azoles, myconazole, uh, all of those guys, allylamines, these guys are going to interfere with the manufacture of ergosterol, which again is going to hit mostly during growth phase. Polymyxin, we've already talked about, it's going to damage the plasma membrane of the gram negatives, but it is definitely toxic, cannot be used internally. It's, all, it's, it's in those three in one antibiotic uh, tubes you can buy over the counter. Pyrazonamide disrupts uh, transport across the plasma membrane, but only of TB. Some of the antiparasitic drugs can work against plasma membranes as well. Inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis. If you stop DNA and RNA, um, you stop the bad guy. Block DNA replication or RNA transcription. And these guys a lot of times can affect both the eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. But these are not things that we use clinically. These are more research, and maybe they use this to slow down cancer cells. But it's, it's not something we're going to use on a, on a every day. Inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis. This is something that we use with viruses. And this is the thing. So we know A, T, C, and G. That's it, right? That's if we've got a DNA virus. What if I give them a phony A that it fits like an A, but it doesn't work like an A? That's the nucleus, nucleotide or nucleoside analogs. We actually give them molecules that look like these nucleotides, but they don't work. They're going to distort the shapes. They're going to keep it from replicating or transcription or translation. And they say these are effective against rapidly dividing cancer cells, and I have heard of that. But this is, this is one of our main ways of getting a hold of the viruses. Quinolones, fluoroquinolones. These guys are going to act against DNA gyrase. When these guys unwind, the DNA gyrase is going to help stabilize that replication fork. So 
it's going to keep these guys from being able to uh, get their RNA polymerase to put that RNA primer down. Reverse transcriptase inhibitors, this is the one like in HIV that the virus itself is RNA and this RNA virus has got a special enzyme so that it can make a DNA copy of itself which is really odd and against the um, the fundamental dictum of, of or dogma of biology. Anyway, these guys, the HIV and its replication, and this, I don't have, and no one, no humans have reverse transcriptase, so it's it's good on selectivity. Antiviral agents, uh, amantadine, ramantadine, weak organic bases. These guys are going to keep the virus from uncoating. By uncoating, we mean coming out of the capsid. Because as long as that virus is in the capsid, he can do nothing. He has to get out inside the cell in order to cause damage or to hijack the, the cellular machinery. Protease inhibitors can also interfere with protease, which is something HIV needs. The HIV drugs, like the TB drugs, are highly specialized, like the cancer drugs. They are very specialized, and you really have to do, you really I kind of almost have to be a specialist to deal with that, at least on a daily basis. I know if I were treating someone like that, I would definitely... I would definitely consult and if, if nothing else at least talk to the people who use those every day and nurses also specialize in areas like that so if that's something you're interested in that is something you in the future who knows uh, the antibacterials that are anti-metabolites competitive inhibitors for metabolic enzymes so all we're saying is that these guys are going to take PABA and they're going to turn it into folic acid. That's the whole point. So we have places where we can strike that. Sulfonamide kind of looks like this PABA, so it can actually come in here and stop this, this production. Uh, it goes down this way. Stop the production right there. Now, sulfur, sulfur, methox, sulfur methoxazole is one of those, like I told you, was in Bactrim. And then trimethoprim will stop it right here at this point. And by stopping it at these two points, you're very effectively shutting it down. And that's why these guys are really good together. Uh, they're going to keep this guy from making his folate, and that's going to stop him. Isonizid, we already talked about several times. Inhibitors of ATP synthase. Beta-qualine is this synthetic antibiotic. It's one of this new class of di diaryl quinolones. It specifically is, is for mycobacterium. Again, think TB. And this compound is going, to, is going to interfere with ATP synthase. If you recall, ATP synthase is the enzyme that does the final um, use of the energy that has been garnered. From the nutrients to take and to put that final third phosphate group onto the ADP. Without this functioning, the bacteria basically is going to run out of fuel. That's basically what it comes to. Okay, more on the antifungals. The most common mode is to disrupt the cell membrane or gosterol. We talked about. Very small differences between cells of fungi and humans, and that's part of the problem. Steros, we've already talked about. 
as far as the inhibition of the fungal walls, these guys are those polysaccharides. These guys were definitely not found in it. We don't have cell walls. The iconocondins can inhibit the uh, enzyme that synthesizes the glucan, which is going to be one of the building blocks. Um, there it is right there. This guy's uh, the nicomycin and polyoxins are going to inhibit the chitin synthesis right here. The inhib inhibition of the, the uh, ergosterol polyenes inhibit mitochondrial function, naphthoquinone. Lucidocene, Griseofulvin is an old one, but it's it's still used by some of the older physicians. Disrupt microtubule function. Lucidocene, I've seen that used a lot too. Antiprotozoans. Uh, protozoans can be a real problem. Malaria is a, is a protozoan parasite. Uh, let's see. Naphthoquinone, the Teovoquone, the malaria, babesiosis, toxoplasmosis. That's not totally unheard of. Inhibit folic acid, proquinol combination therapy with the Teovoquone for malaria. Sulfonamide, sulfadiazine, malaria, toxoplasmosis, pyrimethamine, combination therapy with sulfoxidine for malaria, um, quinine and the quinolones, chloroquine, these guys, there's a lot of resistance. That's why you're seeing all these other drugs used for malaria. Once upon a time, quinine and was the drug of choice, and then chloroquine came out as an improvement, but the malaria uh, Paris protozoans have been developing resistance to this, and that's a problem. Over a million people a year die from malaria, and a lot, too many of them are children. Okay, artesmacinin, combination therapy, malaria, metronidazole, that's also called flagyl, uh, Giardia. Giardia is what you get for drinking uh, water from the woods without boiling it or iodining it. Entomoeba, histolytica, and amoebic infection. Trichomonas. Uh, vaginalis, sexually, a sexually transmitted infection. But flagyl is good for these guys. Flagyl is also good. We didn't show it on the previous, but we also use this for the anaerobic bacteria. Flagyl works very good with, the, uh, with those guys. So um, C. difficile, drug of choice is flagyl first, and then if flagyl fails, then vancomycin. Okay. Pentamidon. Uh, African sleeping sickness and leishmaniasis. We're going to talk about all of these guys when we when we get to the end of this semester. Um, mepacrine, mefloroquine, uh, again malaria. Malaria is probably going to be our biggest uh, protozoan disease problem. Not so much here where we are. I mean, used to. There was a lot of malaria in the southern United States, but there was a lot of effort put in ridding uh, us of the malaria protozoa, and it's worked. So we don't have as much malaria. Malaria used to be endemic all the way up to maybe, uh, I don't know, Virginia, Washington, D.C. Prevention of virus attachment and entry attachment antagonist block virus attachment of receptor proteins. Uh, apparently, this is what they're doing. 
Remember those spikes on the virus, there's receptors on the cell, and those receptors, this is like a key in a lock. When he fits in there, that's going to cause the cell to do the endocytosis and bring in the bad guy. So, what if I could block this guy? Then nothing happens. So that's going to be interesting to watch that. I hope they, get, they have a lot of success with that. Because again, we don't have very much in the way of antivirals. What we do have is just so-so. Uh, some pathogens are naturally resistant. Um, if you have mycoplasma, pneumonia, atypical pneumonia, none of the penicillins or cephalosporins are going to do any good because that bacteria doesn't have a cell wall. So you've got a problem. So some things that they just don't have, that's natural resistance. They can also acquire resistance. This is what's happening. Mutations in their chromes, chromosomal genes. So when they do their, their replication, they might make a mistake. And instead of putting an A there, they may put a C. And that might give them enough variants that it no longer works. There are bacteria that have have altered their method of, of attaching those NAM units to each other so penicillin doesn't work. And there's some that actually have anti-penicillin molecules that they release so that the penicillin is deactivated before it ever gets there. And the biggest way, you, you hear these gut called anti-beta-lactams is they just break that. If you break the, ba the beta-lactam ring, then you no longer, it's no longer effective. Okay, they can also get this, we talked about this plasmids, uh, they can get it during transformation, they can get it transduction, they can get it through that conjugation with the, uh, with the sex pili. Okay, so let's talk about any, uh, antibiotic resistance among these guys. Produce enzymes that destroys or deactivates the drug. We talked about the anti-beta-lactamases. -lact Slow or prevent entry of drug into the cell. Some bacteria will actually, the, as the drug comes in, they will pump it out. They have the ability to pump it out. Alter target of drugs so it binds less effectively. We talked about that. Alter their own metabolic chemistry so that they do things in a different way. Oh, we already talked about pumping it out. And of course, we know that in a biofilm covered by this big polysaccharide coating, it's really hard for the antibiotics to get in there, get to the bacteria, and kill them. Uh, the TB produces this MFPA protein, binds to the DNA gyrase, and keeps the fluoroquinolone drugs from binding. Efflux pump fluoroquinolones, aminoglycosides, tetracycline, beta-lactams, macrolides, just pump them out. Block penetration, beta-lactams, tetracyclines, fluoroquinolones. Do you remember these guys have to get inside because their targets are inside. Their targets are going to, well, except for the beta-lactam, these targets are going to be the their uh, ribosomes. Inactivation, the beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, macrolides, rifampin. Target modification, fluoroquinolones. I'm not going to read all these to you. You guys can read for yourself. But these are the ways that the, the bacteria can develop resistance to our drugs. 
And really, the antibiotics have been responsible for saving so many lives or increasing our lifespan. And the antibiotics are starting to lose some of their effectiveness. Now the beta-lactamase, pilocinamase, when there's it, we already talked about it. They break this guy open. And now it's no longer good for uh, antibiotic properties. Multiple resistance and cross resistance. Yes, there's a lot. Some of these guys have resistance to more than one drug. When I told you when we were doing the, uh, when we do our lab or our, our culture and sensitivity, we call it a CNS. When I take a, a whether blood sample, wherever the patient has infection, I take a sample, grow it, and this is probably not the way they do it. This is probably an old way, but it gives you an, an indication. So we we take those, we we grow the bacteria on a plate, which takes about 48 hours, and then they also check this for which drug has the greatest effect against them. You remember maybe the Kirby Bauer from um, the lab? Kirby Bauer is you take and you get a bacterial line. You can see all the bacteria growing here. And then they have these little paper discs. This one has got uh, amoxicillin clavonic, clavulonic, or clavonate. That's what it was like. That's also, that's just augmentin, the thing we give the little people for their ear infections. This one has got one of the newest ones, the astreonam. It's one of the carbapenems. And you, you measure how far out that drug will actually suppress the bacteria. And so you can get an idea. So when I get the CNS back, I get a list of drugs. It's going to say R or S. R is resistant, S is susceptible. And then they give me a number, and I use that number that if everything else being equal, I will use the one with the largest number because it will be the most effective at, at, uh, at the same dose. Uh, R plasmids, again, these guys exchange these even outside their own species. These guys, hospitals and nursing homes, constantly using drugs. And this is the thing, guys. If only one out of a thousand bacteria has resistance to a drug, more than likely we're going to kill the 999. And all of a sudden, this guy's got all this space and all this nutrients, and he's ready to start dividing. That's a lot. Of, that's part of the reason we sometimes use two or more antibiotics at the same time. Um, ampicillin, gentamicin, and ampicillin is going to attack the bacterial uh, cell wall, while gentamicin is going to attack the ribosomes. So. We want what we want to do is make sure if we kill 999 with drug A, drug B will kill this last guy right there so that we don't have any drug resistance. The ones that they call multi drug, drug resistant have at least three antibiotics that they're immune to. Um, cross resistance to similar drugs, so if they have a resistance to ampicillin. They may have a, a resistance to uh, any of the cephalosporins as well, since they're very similar. Retarding resistance, maintain high concentration for a sufficient time. I don't think we really talk about this in this chapter, but again, you know, the antibiotic peaks and then it goes down. And part of that's going to be elimination by the liver, which is going to detoxify it. So this has to do with how often we dose it. Whether you take it every four hours or every eight hours depends on how fast it goes. If I want the drug level to be here on the average, then I may have to start 
doing like this in order to keep it on the on the level that I want. Um, this is also one of the reasons that tuberculosis started to become so resistant to drugs. Is to be honest with you, the folks that were getting TB were not folks that had addresses. They were folks that lived under railroad bridges and folks from prison. Um, I'm not not knocking these people. I'm just being factual. And they would get tuberculosis. They would go and they'd take treatment for a little while. And then they would move on to a different town. It's just what we always tell people. Take your antibiotics until they're all gone. Don't don't stop taking them when you feel better because if you do, you might leave this one guy there and he's coming back and he's going to get you and this time the antibiotic that I use won't work. But that's why I directly observed therapy. They call it DOTS. It's when people have to actually swallow their tuberculosis antibiotics in front of our nurse and verify that they took it because otherwise the non-compliance is, is part of what breeds this. And it's the same with people with other things. If you if you don't take your antibiotics till they're gone, you may just be breeding super, back, super bugs as they call them. And we already talked about using uh, antibiotics in conjunction. Efficacy of antibiotics antibiotics, that diffusion susceptibility test, uh, minimum inhibitory concentration, MIC, that's the number that I was telling you guys about, minimum bacterial cytal concentration test, diffusion, this is our curvy bowel, no we haven't talked about that yet, we're going to talk about that in the lab, so you guys get it. So. Without a doubt, that bacteria is resistant to this guy. Look at that. The bacteria is growing right up to the disc, probably going under it. This guy is a little bit better, about the same. This is the looks to me to be the most effective of the drugs that they're testing there. Now, this cleared area is called the zone of inhibition. So you've got bacteria growing everywhere except where the antibiotic discs are, except for this guy. That This is the Kirby Bauer test. We'll talk way more about it. Minimum inhibitory concentration test. As you go this way, the amount of drugs increase, their concentration increases. Minimum inhibitory, these are the turbid, remember turbidity? Is indicative that the bacteria are growing. These are clear. So I would say this would be the minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the lowest dose at which it clear is clear. In other words, the lowest dose that completely shuts down the bacteria. I hope that makes sense, guys. It's, it's really not that hard. An E test was aspect of. Kirby Bauer and MIC. Um, I'll be honest with you, I don't know anything about that. That's medical lab technology. Minimum bacterial concentration test. These guys have no drugs on them. They do the clear MIC tubes. So we've got this is the concentration of drugs. So at 25 micrograms per milliliter, there's no bacterial growth. At 16, there's no bacteria. At 8, there are bacteria. So this would be the minimum bacterial cytal concentration. This stuff's not that hard, guys. Well, I know it's been a long one, and this ends Unit 2. So let me know if you got any questions, guys. Thanks.